Okay, so uh, our second, our next speaker is Jonathan Madajian. Madajian, I'm so sorry. And he'll be discussing laser ablation uh, for the propulsion of comets. And uh, he is also from UC Santa Barbara. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, yep, I'm going to be talking about that. You just heard him say it, and you probably read it while he was talking, so I won't say it again. Um, so first I'm going to go over the problem and our solution, our theoretical model, research results, and then cover some applications. So I think a lot about meteors, the purity of them. Boom, the end. Start again. From the recent Ultron movie. So uh, a lot of blockbuster movies cover the topic of asteroids and meteors coming down to Earth. And they have quite large budgets and have been very profitable at the box office. So our idea is to actually build something that'd be feasible for defending the planet from these threats that doesn't involve calling in a team of superheroes or Bruce Willis. <laughs> so it's a very serious problem though. Uh, over Russia, just in 2013, over a thousand injuries occurred when a meteor exploded in the air. And there was roughly $33 million in damages. So this is a, a serious problem that we as scientists would like to tackle. Our solution is called the Directed Energy System for Targeting of Asteroids and Exploration, or DSTAR. And yes, the R is in the middle of exploration. <laughs> so the basic idea is that if you've got an asteroid, you shoot a laser at it, you're going to create this hot spot, and ejection is going to occur where stuff's going to fly off in the other direction. And Newton's third law says if stuff's flying that way, the asteroid will go the other way. And we have uh, experimental results from our lab that you just saw a video of, uh, proving that this idea actually works. Um, but what I'm interested in is rotating asteroids. So what you see here is a plot showing diameter of asteroid versus rotation period in hours. So what you'll notice is that there's this really sharp cutoff around two hours. Um, and that's the gravitational limit. Basically, anything that spins too fast is just going to tear itself apart. Um, so these up here tend to be large rubble piles that are gravitationally bound and have a period that's independent of diameter and dependent on density. These ones down here are super fast rotators. They're molecularly bound and have an irregularity in their period due to something called the Yorp effect. Now, this blue line here Everything to the left of that is going to be so small that it's just going to get broken up in Earth's atmosphere. So those aren't so much, uh, aren't so worrisome. But what I'm interested in are these super fast rotators that are big enough to get by Earth's atmosphere. So what is the deal with rotating asteroids? This is the part I think is really cool. So you shoot a laser beam at an asteroid that's spinning. What you're going to get is a spot that smears across the surface. That means the ejection is no longer going to be uh, in line with the laser beam, and you're going to get a thrust vector that is no longer aligned with your laser beam. So, we take a look at the physics of what's going on here. You have the thermal uh, energy of the laser that you're pumping into the asteroid. Energy is leaving via radiation, uh, and that we model with the Stephen Boltzmann law. You have the flux of conduction entering the asteroid that we model with Fourier's law, and then the flux of ejection that we cover with the Antoine equation. So if you're not bored already, now's the time to fall asleep. So I'm going to go into the math. OK, so we have these four fluxes, laser in, and then those three things out. So uh, using the beam radius, the standard deviation, and laser power, we're able to calculate the laser flux with the standard Gaussian beam profile. Stefan Boltzmann's law, using his constant and temperature, we can calculate the radiation. Uh, Fourier's law with the temperature and thermal conductivity, we can calculate thermal conduction. And then for the big one, the flux of ejection is kind of complicated. First, you need to use Antoine's equation with his three constants uh, that are specific to each material and vapor pressure. Then you take that and plug that into a modified Langmuir equation, which takes a whole bunch of constants, mass, vapor pressure, and temperature. And then that you then multiply by the heat of vaporization to get the flux of ejection. So at the end of the day, you have this massive nastiness down there. But here's the good news. We have a computer program that can solve all that math for us. So we put all those nasty equations into a program called Console, and it can solve these multi-physics interdependent phenomena. 
So that means that you know you have the laser heating things up, the conduction cooling things down, and the uh, all the different fluxes doing what they do, and they're all interacting with each other. And this program can handle that. And then it outputs temperatures in 4D. So you're probably wondering, what does that look like? How about some results? All right. So this right here is a rotating asteroid with a 100 second period over the course of four days. And what you're seeing is the laser turning on, heating a spot, and then that hot spot smearing across the surface of the asteroid. So I, I think it's rather beautiful for today. So here's some actual data. What we learned is that when we increase the thermal conductivity by 250,000%, we only saw a thrust change in negative point two percent, negative two percent, which basically means that the conduction that you see into the asteroid is pretty much negligible. So uh, for this next graph, I'm going to define x in this direction and y in this direction. And what you see here is up here, this, uh, you have a period on this axis and thrust on this axis. So this is the case of a pretty much non-rotating asteroid. And what you'll see is that the thrust maximizes. Um, down here is the really fun case where you get a strong Y component to your thrust. And then over here is the super fast rotator case. In this case, your asteroid is spinning so fast that the temperature across the entire surface is the same and you get no net thrust because it's ejecting in every direction. So um, now to compare asteroids and comets. Uh, on the left, we have the asteroid case. On the right, comets. And you can see the normalized thrust versus period. And the basic conclusion you can draw from all this data that we took with multiple laser powers, multiple size asteroids, and different types of comets uh, is that comets reach equilibrium sooner because of their thermal properties. Um, here's another graph. Uh, this one has the asteroid period varied. So this is actual multiple different cases. And what you'll see is that uh, the faster asteroids have a lot of smearing versus the stationary ones where it looks like just a single spot because there's no smearing occurring. So here, this is plotting max temperature uh, for asteroids versus comets. Again, for a variety of different asteroid compositions and uh, laser powers. And you'll notice that the comets don't reach as high temperatures and they reach those temperatures sooner. So that was an interesting uh, find. Over here, I'm going to define this angle theta to be the difference uh, between the, well, you can see what that angle means. It's the thrust vector versus the x-axis. So over here, you'll notice that theta goes to pi over 2, which makes sense because that's when you're maximizing your y component. You're not going to get anything past that. Otherwise, the asterisk would be going backwards. That'd be kind of strange. Um, and you'll notice, yet again, comets reach equilibrium sooner for the same laser setups. So, to conclude, due to the material properties of comets under comparable laser ablation, comets reach thermal equilibrium more quickly than asteroids. Therefore, thermodynamically speaking, comets are easier to deflect than asteroids. So, uh, some other applications. You could use uh, the V-Star system that you heard about earlier to defend the planet. You could also use it to detect asteroids in the sky. You just sort of scan until you hit something. Uh, you could use them to capture by basically uh, manipulating an asteroid or comet into a capture device. And you could mine the asteroid um, for either rocket propellant or minerals to use in space exploration. Other applications include composition analysis where you could ablate the surface, have ejecta come off, and then use your laser spot on the surface of the rock as a backlight to perform spectroscopy. Uh, we also propose mitigating space debris, basically blasting the space junk out of the sky to help clear up more orbits for commercial and um, other space use. Uh, interstellar propulsion, if you've got a giant laser, the photon pressure from the laser is actually enough that you can push small craft through space, and at interstellar, uh, two interstellar distances at near the speed of light. You could also power beam just by sticking a solar panel either on your spacecraft or on your Mars base or moon base. You could send power from Earth uh, to a remote location. 
And because of the phased array design that we discussed earlier, you could do all of this simultaneously. And that is project overview, theoretical model, research results, and applications, and total the DSTAR project. Thank you. So there's a few different options. Uh, we're currently looking at both ground-based, space-based, and a third option, which is to build it on the dark side of the moon. So, would it, so does the laser just like scan all the time, or does it know Or does a person have to like, build it on the moon? So um, it's a multi, it, it can multitask. So it can be searching for uh, asteroids at the same time it's deflecting a known one. Uh, there, are other, there are many current projects that are looking at uh, detecting asteroids because it's really hard to find a black spot on a black sky. And in fact, many amateur astronomers have accomplished a lot by helping scientists find comets and asteroids today. Um, you're very nice job laying out the model, by the way. But uh, it's essentially a steady state model, right? You're, you're doing a steady state analysis. Have you guys looked at it with an impulsive approach where you say the policy of light is, you know, essentially sharp and seeing how it responds? Um, yes, in fact, I've been interested in that for quite a while. Uh, what we found is that the most critical factor is raising the temperature of the asteroid to uh, the 3,000 degrees that it needs to get and getting that constant mass ejection because you could pulse it, you'd get a burst, but what you really want is that extended period of thrust. So. so is there some measure of time on how long it takes to get up to 3,000 degrees in the sort of asteroid? Um, I mean, it does happen nearly instantly. So it's not so much a matter of needing to linger to heat it up. It's a matter of you want to keep it going. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's so, do one more thing. We're going to the power here. You kind of have the idea of potentially transferring power. What kind of information do you need to get out of Well, I mean, you, okay, so you start off with wall plug efficiency of lasers themselves hovering between 40 and 60%. So you're already losing a lot there when you just go from your wall outlet to your laser. Then you've got if you decide to go with the ground-based laser, you've got huge optical losses through the atmosphere. Um, but the point being that if you could pull something like this off, you could actually put more power on the sol onto a solar panel than the sun could. So in any case, you're doing better than just if your solar panel getting light in the sun. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you. Just as loading things up, do we have any more presenters who have come in? Presenters? Uh,